Eastern here on EWTN. Blood of Christ, price of our salvation. Pray for us. The litany of the most precious blood of Jesus on EWTN. Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Well, good evening, everybody. And we have just wonderful, wonderful people here from just about every state that makes us very happy because it's always good to see the ones you're talking through through that television camera and it brings us more together and brings us at home at home with each other you know we we've gone in many parts of the world to bring the good news and Everybody seems to be in the same boat. Everyone hungers for God. Everyone needs the Lord. A tremendous amount of people don't know they need God. They go every direction possible. And everywhere they go, they, they still feel that vacuum, you know, that hunger for God. And the reason is we were made for God, we were made by God, and we were created for a specific mission, special work. And, and one day the Lord, apostles came home, they were all excited. I mean, the Lord sent them out two by two and he said, go and heal. Oh, wow. And they came back all excited and I can see Peter say, Master, I touched a man that was blind from birth and he could see. And another one would say, oh, Master, I touched a man who was crippled, and he began to walk. Oh, were they excited. Well, the Lord has a knack of putting a pin in your bubble. Do you ever do that to you, huh? I mean, he's got a knack for that. And he said, oh, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Oh, can you hear what he's saying? Now that's a wonderful thing. I wish I could go to a hospital and zip in every room and everybody'd walk out laughing up, just running around the hallway. I don't know if the nuns would appreciate that. But I think it would be an awesome thing. And the Lord says, Oh, don't 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 worry about that. Your names are written in heaven. That's what you have to, have to think about. All of you that are Catholic, all of you that are Christian, and got news for you, Catholics are also Christian. <laughs> it's amazing how many people think Catholics are not Christian. But your names are written in heaven. And everybody ever born, pagans, atheists, whatever, agnostics, all have their name written in the heart and mind of God. Why? Because he created them. Whether they know it or not, 
He did create them. And you see, you see this hunger for God even in little children. Little children. So tonight, we're going to talk about modesty. And I know you're surprised, yes. and so am I, because you would say, what has that to do with holiness? A lot. A lot. Modesty is a virtue like prudence today that is rather thin in our lives. In fact, it's a kind of wholesale um, nudity. You know, we were in, uh, I think it was Peru. And we turned a corner and there was a little uh, grassed island in the corner, on the corner of the square. It's a big city. And right standing in the middle was a woman as noon as nude as the day she was born. And I thought it was a statue. <laughs> when you go to Italy, you see a lot of these nudie statues, you know, and you take it for granted, but I realized that statues don't move. <laughs> and she was yelling and screaming and doing all kinds of things. And it was pitiful because Obviously, she was not mentally right, and I'm sure they picked her up at some point. But I thought to myself, it kind of depicts the, the tenure of the day, you know? We, we seem to have lost the reality that you and I are temples of the Holy Spirit. The bad part about it is that to many, that's a kind of pious thought. Well, it goes beyond thought. It is a reality. And St. Paul says it in his scriptures, in the scriptures here. He said, do you not know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? Sometimes we pass churches that have been defamed and terrible things written on the doors. And, it's, um, and you, you get it in here. One, at one time, that church was a temple of God. The bad thing of it is, it is still a temple of God, as defamed as it is. And that's how it is with you and I. We are temples of the Lord. And I think we haven't talked about modesty because in the world there hardly isn't. One time we were in Italy and we passed this particular street and there was a big billboard with a, another nude woman standing there. I was curious what she was advertising. There wasn't much left to the imagination, so I knew she had to be advertising something. And so I said to my interpreter, what does that say? And she said, it's an advertisement for furniture. Said, furniture? <laughs> Are you kidding? She said, no. Oh, so our, our whole mental attitude towards modesty is almost non-existent. Women have never been so defamed as they are this century. See, because they're, they're either appearing half nude, all nude, or very little on. And, and you wonder why we allow that as women. You know, why do we allow this to go on when we're temples of the Holy Spirit? You're, you're not prostitutes. You're, you you got to understand that, that Jesus created you, the Father created you, the Spirit created you for one purpose, to be a gentle woman, to be a woman that knows Jesus, knows God, and has all the qualities of a beautiful woman. And, and we've lost that. You know, one time in the life of John, Pope John the 23rd, before he was Pope, when he was a cardinal in France, he was at a large banquet. 
And the woman next to him at the table had an extremely low-cut dress. And so when the dessert was passed around, he handed her an apple. And uh, she looked at him and she said, uh, Your Eminence, uh, is there some reason you're handing me an apple? He said, yes. He said, uh, when Eve ate the apple, she realized she was naked. <laughs> I thought that was terrific, you know. He could have laid her out, he could have moved, he could have done anything. And, and she took the apple and he said, I, I just thought it would give you some light, you know. Since the apple was strong enough in Eve's time, it might help her a little bit. And, and that's what we need to understand. I got a letter the other day from a young girl. 23 years old, and she says, I have a problem. She said, the problem is that more and more people are coming to Mass with shorts, t-shirts, tennis shoes. Some people come to Mass dressed as if they're going to the beach. Doesn't say much, does it? This lady had all her kids in shorts told me that God doesn't care. What do you think? Well, I think God cares. When you go out, ask yourself a question. Would I dress like this if I were to see the Queen of England? Would I dress like that to see John Paul? Well, you wouldn't even get in if you were dressed that way. Would I dress this way if I were going to see anyone famous, any celebrity, would I dress this way before God? You see, a lady told Jacinta in Fatima, she said, dress, different designs will be introduced that will offend the Lord very much. That should be enough for all of us. I'm not saying you have to dress like a nun, you must dress as a woman who knows her place and her dignity, her dignity. I don't know how you can go before the Blessed Sacrament in your churches and not be dressed. See? There's something wrong, something wrong with our belief in the real presence, real presence. If we were to see our dear Lord, <laughs> it would be bad, huh? Because we don't believe really that he's there. Oh, some women would never dress the way they do. I know some of you are going to get kind of peeved tonight, but I'd rather have you go to heaven peeved and go somewhere else. <coughs> Very happy. See, nobody tells you because they're afraid to hurt your feelings. Some of you old gals, believe me, cover it up. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever was there, it's gone. <laughs> I, I just... I think I, if I had the money, I would buy everybody a long mirror. <laughs> I think that would be money well spent. Well spent. Because you can't look at a mirror and see how you look. And if you had two mirrors, one in the front of you and one in the back of you, you would see things everybody else sees. <laughs> I think you'd get red if you're alone. And you see that that's a lack, a lack of understanding. When you dress like some of you dress, you create, you're the cause of many temptations of lust in many men. Why? Because. 
So the Lord is asking all of us, all of us, to be modest, to be modest. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. When you go into the chapel, any chapel, any chapel, be sure you're going in as a woman of God, a woman very much aware of her dignity as a woman. That's an awesome dignity you have as a woman. You are made in a special way for God. You're made to be that mortar between all the brick in this edifice, this church, this world we live in. And you have great power, power of love, power of kindness, power of, of understanding, power of understanding. So please, if I were you, I would examine myself and see, do I dress in a way that Jesus would be pleased? Would I dress in a way that I can come before the Blessed Sacrament or come to Mass in a way that he would be pleased with? If you ask yourself that question, you'll be surprised. He will give you light. Do you know in Galatians it says, what the Spirit brings is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, modesty, modesty, trustfulness and self-control. Self-control. This is Galatians 5, 22. You're going to look it up in your, in your Bibles. Now, he said, we must understand that these come from the Spirit. Anything else does not come from God. So from now on, when you present yourself, whether you're at work or wherever, present yourself before the Lord with all the beauty a woman is to have, with all the understanding. It says, I love you. That's what it says. It says to everybody, I love you. And it doesn't matter if you're beautiful or ugly or in between. That has nothing to do with it. All women are beautiful when they have those qualities a woman should have. So I'm asking you, please, when you go to Mass, remember you're going to a banquet. You're going to the sacrifice of the Mass. And it's an awesome occasion. Dress for it. Dress for it. Dress like you know where you're going. And modesty means eyes, too. Oh, there's modesty of the eyes that we don't even think about. You know, I have to tell you, I think I told some of you this. One time I went to a doctor's office. You know how they have these magazines sprout all over the place. Since I'm not interested in hunting, I put that magazine down and and uh, and there was one on rifles, so I put that one off. And here comes up Life magazine, and and, uh, and then that wasn't too bad. And then you wait almost two and a half hours before you get in there, and you spend 20 minutes in there. I had a lot of time to read, so I opened a book, and I, I there was just a picture that nobody should see. So I said, Aha. I had a little mini book in my pocket, and it was The Power of Suffering, just a little mini book that we have hundreds of. And I, I, I took that book, and I went like this, and I went, pew. Can you imagine the man who opened that book <laughs> to that terrible page and saw the healing power of suffering. <laughs> Why don't you do that sometime when you go to a doctor? It's a great place to evangelize. Bring a little mini book with you, a little leaflet. And when they have magazines that you're not interested, or they shouldn't be in a doctor's office, stuff them <laughs> with mini books. 
leaflets, anything, anything. You can save a soul by doing that, just a little thing. So you know what billboards are. Don't look at them. You should keep your eyes on the road anyway. So please guard your eyes. There are many places you shouldn't go. Why? Because this is an offense in today's world that greatly, greatly, greatly offends the Lord. And you and I as Christians, as Catholics, have to repair for a lot of this. See? We cannot be the occasions. We have to repair. So say your prayers and ask our dear Lord and our dear Lady to give us all light, all light, not to offend our Lord by the way we dress, the way we act, and what we look at. Huh? I think that is enough on modesty. In Galatians, which I wanted to read you tonight, <clears throat> we have a, a, a problem in the world today of everybody looking for someone else but Jesus. You find this if you travel to other countries, you find it everywhere. They got the Mooniites and New Age and the cults, cults, satanic cults, all kind of cults. It only proves that we're all hunting, we're all looking, and, and we don't seem to find it anywhere. We don't seem to find what we're looking for. And you're not until you go for Jesus until you look for the one true only God. And until we do that, we are definitely not going to get anywhere. Now, somebody want to ask, where is Galatians? Galatians 5, 22, in case you didn't hear. Now, we want to look at the church. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. She leads us to holiness. She leads us to goodness. She leads us to compassion. Wounded as she is today. And when you travel a lot, you, you realize how wounded the church is in so many places. But the church is our teacher. The church is our guide. The church is the way. The church leads us to Jesus in all things. And Our Lady leads us to Jesus. We saw a very simple devotion in Colombia. It was, it's called the, the Divino um, Nino, the Divine Infant. And, and the, the statue is about this big, and the basilica is huge. I mean, it, oh, I never saw such a basilica for this little guy. And I found that the priest who brought it to Columbia had the same name as my father, John Riso. So here's this big statue of him. And I looked at him and I thought, are you a relative? Could it be I have a relative that's a saint in my poor family? I didn't know, but I was excited. And I read the history a little bit of this priest. He was so simple. He came from Italy, went to Columbia, a Salesian, saw the poverty, the awesome poverty and the sickness. And, and he would have these people, by the thousands would come. And he had this little Nino in his room and he'd go to it and he would say, little Nino, you see those people out there? They came for you, they didn't come for me. What are you gonna do for them? They're hungry. I can't do anything for him. What are you going to do for him? And you go out, and I don't think five minutes would pass. And people would come with carts full of bread and beans and everything. And then he'd go back again, he'd say, Nino, it's terrible. Those people are so sick. They can't afford a doctor. Why don't you heal them, huh? What are you doing for these people? And he'd go out and he would touch people, boom. The worst diseases were healed. I was impressed by his simplicity with God. Do you know? 
he talked to God from his heart. And, and, and we don't know how to do that. We, we've lost the reality that you and I are, are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Oh, I, I, I can't, I wish so much I could just put that into everybody. What, a, what an awesome gift we have. I'm a daughter of the Most High God. And he loves me. He loves you. And some of you out there are, are laden with such sin on your soul. So much sin. If you knew how much he loves you, oh, you would run to confession. You would never be scrupulous. or You would never be afraid, afraid to, to tell a priest anything. If you know you're loved, that's the greatest gift in the world. And, and we got to know that one thing. You and I are loved. And I, I saw people who were so poor, so poor. They live on the streets. They eat on the streets. They sleep on the streets. They sleep in parks about 25 in, in the groups of 25 or 50, and, and I wondered why they were so happy during the day. I couldn't figure it out, because they seem to have something that those who have everything don't have. And, and when you went up to them, they were very mild and gentle people probably didn't have the attachments we have. I don't know what it is, but they knew God. And, and outside there, at a Mass, there were 8,000 of them. At the end of Mass, the father said, I'm going to blow all the children. And you just saw like popcorn. All of a sudden, all these little kids started rising up from the crowd. And they were all, some of them very one year old, two years at the most. And, and when they were raised up, they outwave in the father. Even at that age, they had a kind of devotion. See? And we're almost ashamed to have devotion today. Why? Why? Devotion is my expression of love to God. That's what it is. And we should talk to God as a friend speaks to a friend. This priest from Italy, he, he was a simple man. He knew God was listening. He knew the people were in need. And, and you and I have to give that, get back to those devotions we used to have. To speak to God as a friend speaks to a dear, dear friend. A friend who understands. You can't even tell him anything he doesn't understand. You can tell him everything is on your heart, everything is on your mind. And, and we miss that. We miss it. Because we're so sophisticated today, we're so intelligent, we're so intellectual, we know so much. And God, who created it all, knows you and I heart to heart, mind to mind. You know, it, it's such an awesome thing to know that God is really beyond our imagination, our knowledge, our anything. He's beyond, above. And that God loves me. Mm. If you don't learn anything from this network, if the people who travel so many miles to get here don't learn anything else but this one thing, your lives will be so much happier. That the God who created stars and creation and mountains and sky and sea with every kind of animal, every kind of flying bird, everything, every creature that's ever been, loves me. Oh, wow. 
if you could think of that, a lot of your problems would suddenly become extremely small. God loves me. It's an awesome thought, and it's a reality. He loves me. And if you don't get to heaven, if you make a wrong choice, no one in heaven will fill your place. I told you one time when my grandma would make bread and she'd slice it for supper, I would go and she wasn't looking and I would take a slice from the middle, see, and I'd push it together. <laughs> and I have a sneaking suspicion she knew that. But that's not how heaven is, see. If you don't get there, that place will be empty forever. Nobody will take your place. You're going to go, and you're that one person, and you will know Jesus as if no one else were there, and you will enjoy everyone. So remember your dignity. You won't have to think about modesty because it will come from your heart. You will want to be. You will want to be proud to stand in front of the Lord God. We have a call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Hey, where are you from? I'm from Birmingham. Can you speak just a little louder? Sure. There I'm you from, go. From Birmingham. Good. I uh, just wanted to, first of all, thank you very much for your television network because, because of you and God and, and your television network, my husband and I became... Catholic converts back in April. Wonderful. Thanks for Jesus. And in the vein of what you're speaking of tonight on modesty, I just wanted to call and say that that is one of the big holdups that we're having in finding a parish for ourselves here in uh -huh. Birmingham. We uh, attended the RCIA classes in a parish and decided, because we listened to you and, and knew what to look for in a parish, that this parish was not for us. And one of the things was the immodest ways that the people were allowed to dress in the parishes. Yeah. We have uh, mm. searched high and low yeah. in Birmingham and have not found that parish yet for this reason. I contacted several priests, called and to ask them specifically, what is your stand? One priest out of about 15 parishes in Birmingham told me that he would stand against and ask someone to leave if they were not dressed properly. And my comment from every other priest was the same. I would rather have them here dressed that way than not have them here at all. That's a, that's a kind of a cop-out, I think. Um, no one should be hurt if you tell them, we have paper skirts upstairs. <laughs> I mean, I know your women are kind of fussy about what you wear, but since you're not fussy about what you wear and you're not covered where you should be, I think a paper skirt is wonderful. They're free. I give it to you free. But see, that, that's, that's bad because if our dear Lord is offended by dress, then I don't know how you could say, well, it's better you go in uh, and then not go in at all. Why, why? You know you cannot get into the Basilica at the Vatican at all. These guards all the way there. If you're not dressed properly, I saw an entire bus of Austrian children, you know, Austrian mountain climbers dress. They, they were sitting on the steps. They were not allowed to go in. You know, there's a dress code in some supermarkets. I was shocked. I said, everybody in this, coming in this supermarket must wear shoes. I said, shoes? I looked around and now even in a supermarket, you go into a fine restaurant, you cannot go in. If it's, if it's a dress restaurant, you can't go in dressed like, well, you're half dressed. I don't understand. See, a lot of places you go have dress, you're almost proud of it. Oh, I went to this restaurant, everybody knows you have to be right, you have to dress right, and you have to act right. You're, you're proud of that. You're proud that you are one of the people that can go to that restaurant. See, well, why is it? Are we saying that all of these women, that 90% of the women, are not going to go to Mass if they have to dress properly. 
whoa, I cannot believe that 90% of the Catholic women in the world think like that. I think they've never been told. That's the only thing. That's why I'm telling you now. You have to be told. So please, you know, <laughs> don't find out too late that we have offended the Lord. I, I put scruples on you, for goodness sakes. Well, you must have some kind of a decent dress at home. Put it on. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? I'm from New York. The well, what is your question? New York, and my name is Joanna. Mm -hmm. I'm a late Carmelite, and I do spiritual direction. Uh-huh. And I have allowed myself, I have to admit I was nervous when I did it, but I had someone come who I had seen in church as a Eucharistic minister, and I was not at all pleased on how she was dressed. And when she next came to see me, I said, you know, I have something that I need to say to you. And I did. She was totally unaware. Oh, yeah. She was just not aware. She has never done it since. And she said, thank you for telling me. And this is a woman who is a very prayerful woman. She just was not aware of how she was dressed. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, um, I think the first thing that they need to know first is the indwelling, like you said, being a temple of the Lord. They don't understand the indwelling to begin with. So no. how can they translate that no. to being in the Eucharistic presence? There's a lack of spirituality in our people because they're not taught. It's not an insult to say, please dress modestly before the Lord God. I, I, that, that's a, I, I have a hard time, and I have a hard time with people feeling hurt. You see, why are you hurt? That, that doesn't make any sense. See, it, it's a, it's it's a, one of these things you don't talk about. But I'm scared of the things you're not allowed to talk about. I'm more afraid of anybody afraid to tell you what you should know. That happens with birth control, abortion. You know, in Omani Vitae, Pope, Pope Paul VI was a real prophet. He said, if abortion is, if contraceptive is allowed, then there will come abortion. And after abortion will come euthanasia. Now we have it all. And now we believe in killing babies that are born, turning them around in a breech position, all for the good of the mother. Does that make any sense to you? That a baby is about to be born turn him around in the breech position and put a hole in his head to suck out brains. Now you tell me, what good have you done to that woman? We're not talking about in the womb. We're talking that this baby is born. I hope you all send your cards out that you were supposed to get from your churches and your diocese. Abortion is killing, whether it's one or millions, millions. In China, 30 million girls have been killed after birth. Why? They happen to be girls. Is it any reason that we are not attuned to the way, how to dress when we accept abortion, murder, assisted suicide has become a point of compassion? How can you say that? So please, the cards that go to your senators and, and, and your congressmen to veto, protest the veto of the partial birth abortion bill. If this country is not laid low by the Lord God, I'd be real surprised. Because we have no regard for the law of God. We have no regard for the laws of the church. We have no regard for the unborn and we have no use for the elderly. We have a call. Hello? Mother? Yes. Hello. Oh, I am so happy to um, finally get through to EWTN on your Thank network. You. Thank God you. God bless you, Mother. Thank we you. We love you here and you've changed our life. 
I, I have a question. I'm in the medical profession. Yes. And I have a question regarding this, this, this one question. I want to see how you would answer it. If God is a God of love, mm. why does he allow little children to suffer and die? Yes. And, Mother, the statistics show that many parents with children that have catastrophic illnesses yeah. end in divorce. Yes. Could you please tell me how you would answer this question? Well, first of all, God is the God of love, and it is not God who does these terrible things. Many people like the only innocents. Let's go back to where our dear Lord, when he was born, uh, about 30, maybe less than that, but they think maybe about 20, 25, or 30 children were slaughtered by Herod's anywhere from one to two years. We call them martyrs now, and we call them holy innocents. There are many reasons why children are born with what they're born with. Many children are deformed. Many children have cleft lips. Many children are syndrome children. Many children are, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. A lot is pollution, a lot are drugs, alcohol, smoking. A lot of these things, p different pills that women take or have to take or think they have to take, uh, all of these things are not God's will. But since God has given us free will, then he permits good and evil. He permits all of us. And there's no one here or no one out there who hasn't been the victim of somebody else's wrong decision not counting the bad decisions we've made on our own. But God, in allowing these things, raises us to a higher level of holiness by bearing the unjust with a loving heart, by bearing our aches and our pains, and most of all, the pain of seeing someone else we love suffer so much. And he sent his son, the suffering servant, as, as a leader for us to follow, as a guide. His own son suffered from what? From the jealousy, the ambition, the rejection of his own. He did nothing to deserve what he got. What came from that? Our redemption. Our redemption came from an unjust judge. The judge Pilate, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who, who should have known this is the Lord Messiah, but he was not the Messiah they wanted. And neither are, is the Lord the, the Lord God we want today. We want the Lord of comfort. We want the Lord of wealth. We want the Lord of everything. The one, the Lord, who gives us the abundant light. And that's another fault we have today in the whole world. We do not preach the cross. You know, Padre Pio said, if we understood the preciousness of suffering in our lives, we would hold it as a treasure. We were born with original sin. And those consequences are always with us. And we manifest them when we're very young. I manifested my anger when I was three by telling my grandmother to shut up. She was, that's my, mo my father's mother. She was always laying into my mother. I was three years old. I can see the stove right now. And the oven door was down and she was railing my mother because she didn't cook the chicken right or whatever. And I looked at her and I said, oh, shut up. You all the time talk, talk, talk. Well, my mother raised me up and kissed me, but my grandmother didn't. <laughs> However, it showed, you know, that that little Italian temper was there, three years old. It's gotten a little better, but not too much better. It's there. But by overcoming, we choose to be like Jesus instead of these other things we are. And little children suffer the best I've ever seen. 
when we get older, we fuss and fume, and the little children suffer for the world. They suffer for mankind. They suffer, as St. Paul said, your lives. This is a wicked generation, he said, and your lives should redeem it. Your lives have to be that that point of of edification. A child that suffers, suffers innocently, like Jesus. A child that suffers, I'm sure, gets a great, great, great reward in heaven. And that's another thing we never hear about. Heaven. Heaven. Where we're going. Where, why we were really born, why we were created. A, a, a static place. A state and a place where we'll never have pain or sorrow or loneliness or aches and pain. And these children suffer greatly. Many of them have cancer. Cancer when they're born. Who can explain it? But Jesus gave us that example. And Jesus knows whom he can trust. He knows who he can trust with pain. And from my own experience, I know next to my vocation, my aches and pains and graces and everything that goes with them are the greatest gift God has given me. Why? Because with my temperament and my, my faults and weaknesses, I, I need that. And not that I don't take my aspirin and all the rest, but I need something that keeps me close to the Lord. It may not be the case with you, but know when the Father looks down on any suffering servant, he looks on you as he looks on his son with great love and understanding. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? I'm calling from Flint, Michigan. Wonderful. What is your question? Well, um, I would like to thank you for uh, talking on the subject of modesty. Uh, nobody does, and we all yeah, ought to. <laughs> and, and I promise I won't be afraid to speak out ever again on Good it. Good for you. Um, my question is, um, we uh, found uh, EWTN on cable about a dozen years ago, and so I've been watching you and the sisters and loving you and praying for you. And um, then we moved away where I couldn't get EW EWTN. And we just recently moved back, and I tuned in, and lo and behold, you and the sisters are in a full habit. Yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, person I talked to explained a little bit about that, but I have no idea why you're wearing a full habit, and I wondered if it had anything to do with the subject of modesty you were talking about tonight. Could you kind of fill us in, those of us who uh, either don't know why or have been away and, and got lost? No, we know why. Um, we felt that... People in the world and all were, were uh, getting wrong impressions of religious life. We felt that we had to be the religious God wanted us to be. Us meaning those of us at Our Lady of Angels Monastery in Birmingham, Alabama. We felt that we had to be a, more of a witness, a witness to everyone that there is here not a lasting place. It's a constant reminder of women who by nature are vain. Not that men are not vain, don't get me wrong. Men are very vain. If they weren't vain, they wouldn't, you know, try to dye their hair when they're getting gray. And but we have to be a witness that there is another life, that that life is worth sacrificing your greatest treasure on earth. On earth. A woman's greatest treasure is her hair. She's all excited when it starts thinning out. She's panicky. She has it done every week, every month, whatever, and it's part of her beauty. Well, we cover ours as that sacrifice. Just say, no, Lord, we are yours. We are totally yours, and we belong to you. The veil is a symbol of total dedication to Jesus. And it reminds lay people, hey, wait a minute. You know, I, I better shape up a little bit. 
I don't even think of God. I don't even think of heaven. I don't even think of where I'm going. I don't even know where I'm going. It's a, a constant reminder. Everybody says, why are you dressed like that? One of our sisters was in a store and a little kid, oh, I don't know, maybe two or two, three years old, maybe, she started running and she said, Mama, there's Mary. <laughs> oh, that was great. Even a child knows when you, when you dress for the full habit, for us. I'm not criticizing anybody that doesn't have a full habit. You all have your own inspirations. You know what you're doing. But for us, the world needs a witness that the things of this world are not lasting. There's more to life than eating, sleeping, drinking, working, joy, pleasure, suffering. There's more. There's a place we're all headed for. And, and when, when we see women that have given it all and given it up, then we're reminded totally reminded and and you see more and more in the world they have forgotten when you when you're when you see a world afraid of talking about modesty in church whew, <laughs> what are where are we going if we're afraid to do that then how are you going to be afraid to say sweetheart you're in adultery oh you don't want to hurt their feeling yeah go ahead hurt them don't be afraid. It, a person that teaches the truth really, really loves you. The ones that keep hedging and make you hear what you want to hear don't love you. They love themselves because they're afraid. They're afraid. Love overcomes fear. I love you. God loves you. Dress like a daughter of the Lord. And you men aren't doing too hot either. <laughs> you walk in church with short shorts on. <sighs> Who wants to sit all during Mass looking at those hairy legs? <laughs> if you could look at yourself, I don't think you'd ever go to Mass looking like that. That the men aren't any better than the women. Don't let don't think you're off the hook. You're not. Dress like a man, for goodness sakes. Dress like a son of God. A daughter of God. Don't be afraid. Remember my old mom. She had many a wonderful little thing. One was everybody else to bring his own carcass to market. When you die, there's nobody going to be there but you and Jesus. And so that one. That's the way it is, we are. Be modest, be loving, be women according to the heart of God. This world would change overnight. Well, I got so intent, I forgot to say, put us please between your electric and gas bill, electric bill, anything. We need you. Without you, it would not last a month. Be generous. Write to Mother Angelica, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. I love you. And never forget, get up in the morning, say, he loves me. That's all that matters. And all during the day, your burden will be lighter because he is with you carrying it. Bye now.
to order this episode of Mother Angelica Live Classics from the EWTN Religious Catalog web store, log on to EWTNRC.com 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, or call 1-800-854-6316. Hello, family. I'm here in Rome, where our EWTN Vatican Bureau works year-round to bring you and millions around the world the latest news from the Universal Church, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. With more than 35 multilingual employees from different countries, the EWTN Vatican Bureau is the largest media organization accredited to the Holy See. Our journalists have come to EWTN from a prestigious list of well-known global outlets, including the BBC, ABC, and the Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. From covering the Pope to telling inspiring stories of faith and courage, the EWTN Vatican Bureau signature TV magazine, Vaticano, gives you and our global audience a front row seat at the heart of the Universal Church. This is only possible with your help. We don't receive funding from the church or advertisers. This network is truly brought to you by you. Today, I hope that you'll make a donation and help us continue sharing news from Rome and around the world. Thank you, and may God bless you. EWTN is 100% viewer supported. Please consider a gift today. Go to EWTN.com slash help today. You may also call us at 1-800-447-EWTN or send your donation to EWTN, 5817 Old Leeds Road, Irondale, Alabama, 35210. Forever will he be venerated, distinguished for a life of heroic virtue. Lift your hearts in prayer as the smiling Pope is honored for his witness to the Christian faithful. From St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, the beatification of Pope John Paul I, Sunday at 4.30 a.m. Eastern and again at 7 p.m. here on EWTN. Don't wait another minute. Now is the time to make your plans to attend the 2022 EWTN Family Celebration. Saturday, October 1st is the day. Phoenix, Arizona is the place. And the theme is Confidence Works Miracles. This is your chance to meet your favorite Catholic TV and radio hosts, Father Mitch Pacwa, Marcus Grodi, Johnette Williams, and you can also take a trip to Father Spitzer's Universe. We'll have Holy Mass and Confession, Family Corner, and you can shop for Holy Reminders at EWTN Religious Catalog. EWTN Radio will be there with a live broadcast, and kids can have fun learning about their faith at the EWTN Kids Booth. The EWTN Family Celebration, October 1st, the Feast of St. Therese at the Phoenix Convention Center in Phoenix, Arizona. For more information, please visit EWTN.com slash Family Celebration. Since its founding by Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago, the church has contended with heretics over questions concerning the very essence of the religion. Where do these ideas come from? And why do they continue to thrive in today's world? Heresies never really go away. Tim Moriarty examines where these ancient beliefs can be still found in today's world. The Heresies on the Global Catholic Network, EWTN. Washington, D.C. is a very strange place. It's a hard place to get information. And one of the things I love about it, though, is if you know the right people, if you make the right contacts, you can learn an awful lot. And most of the time, all you have to do is sit still and listen. I've learned over almost 20 years to listen to the right people. That's what I bring to bear. That's what we bring to this show.